Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's Chew and Chat. Uh, we're joined here to talk about night culture in the city and what it looks like post-pandemic and also some pre-pandemic and what we can do better. We have two amazing guests here today. We have Andrea Horn, uh, owner of Tropical Popical, but also activist, um, runner um, of No More Hotels, or shall I say, director of No More Hotels. It has been a club night that's been running and that's been uh, amazing. I got to DJ at it once actually, and uh, it, it, it's it's all about community and that's what Andrea has been about. She's been building a community. She's been trying to change how we celebrate nightlife and what we do in the city better. We have Mary McSweeney from uh, the Enterprise Office who has been helping a lot of our businesses go, that has been brought up to their knees during uh, their pandemic to, to survive. And she has been also part of the Nighttime Economy Task Force uh, with the department as well. And she has spent uh, many a years trying to figure out how the city should work and businesses and also Nighttime Economy, how that would work as well. So I'm gonna go straight into our guests and get them to tell you a bit about themselves, what they do, and um, also then talk about the city and what we want in future. Uh, and what we can do better. Uh, we want your questions. So at the bottom, there is a Q&A box. If you put your questions in there, I'll try to ask my guest, our guests through um, the questions through the uh, chat. Any questions we don't answer, if we don't get to answer them, please email lordmayor at dublincity.ie and we'll find the answer for you. It's just sometimes we don't get to them. So uh, Andrea, to you first. Dun, dun, dun. Uh... <laughs> I am Andrea and I, as you said, uh, own Tropical Popco, which is an L bar in town and uh, Tropical Popco started for, because of my love of community. I'm not really into the beauty industry or whatever, but that I wanted something that could be anchored in Dublin because I absolutely adore it. Um, so that kind of began my journey with community um, and uh, I also love clubbing. Um, so myself and Dave Byrne set up this Club Night No More Hotels. And the whole point of it was um, looking at how club nights were being uh, challenged in terms of the times that they closed at and with the rise of prints and, uh, and the dem demolition of all the venues for club nights to be in. We were trying to look at how we could restructure a club night to focus on all the additions you could have, um, getting people in early, putting on a show. So it's not just expecting people to come in at one, have their drinks, they're already tanked up from drinking at home uh, and then be kicked out onto the street at three. So it was looking at how we could utilize the time of the night a bit better. So if you had people arriving at eight o'clock, they're going to, uh, they have to be there for the dinner and the show. So you're giving them a reason to be there. So it was looking at utilization of time and making it commercially viable for club owners who were struggling with, um, the parameters that we have in terms of legislation and uh, closing times and all that kind of jazz. So obviously there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more work being done on that by people who are much more experienced in all that kind of jazz and obviously give us a night nice leading the charge along with yourselves on the task force and things like that. So we were kind of just doing it as a way to kind of flip clubbing on its head so that it would be considered culture because we were putting a show element in and we were showcasing the best of the city with the DJs who were playing. Um, and that led on to something that we did then for Culture Night. We teamed up with Pink House, um, an age, a communi communications agency and algorithm. And we uh, projected uh, scenes from clubs that were uh, in places where hotels and student accommodation were now. So it was the eradication of space to dance. All these amazing clubs had gone and we were kind of trying to bring up a question of why are these spaces gone obviously you have the commercial viability but if if our culture in all other aspects is based on the value of culture and bring, like we have a national concert hall we have at the national gallery they're not commercially viable they're not making money why should how do we flip that and make people consider clubbing worthy of being given the space to be considered culture. So we teamed up with uh, Culture Night for that. And then as part of that, then we made a mini documentary, uh, which thank you for featuring in, uh, which has, uh, which is called Clubbing is Culture, which has just, so much of the work is obviously being done behind the scenes. And as someone who's worked, I worked in PR for years, my kind of thought was, okay, when all this work is done, you've got this whole audience of people like my mom and her friends who are like, oh, sure, what would you be talking about clubbing? That's just people going out and getting messed up and there's no value in it. So I was like, 
will the people who are already clubbers already buy into the value of clubbing. It's the people who don't who we need to get on board to get consensus to get the buy in for the clubbing to be included in our community and for to, for them to see the value and obviously we'll be talking about the economy side of things but for me my my side is more the cultural side and I you do have to I suppose prove the economic benefits to get things over the line but I kind of want to flip that and go well isn't it worth having something that dance floors that create a utopia for people and that break down barriers that get people communicating you have all of this happening on a dance floor community starting revolutions beginning why are we not supporting this as a culture in itself and not it doesn't just have to be commercially viable but that's an interesting point in so far. There are many of our galleries and, and spaces that aren't commercially viable, but we support them because we know that art is uh, art, uh, artistry and creativity needs to be supported. So, and this is something that I, I've always found odd with clubbing. Uh, like I, I used to work for John Reynolds. I used to work for Electro Picnic. I, I grew up in a restaurant. I, I, I also know that the value behind the industry, apart from just the dancing and apart from what people think about going out and getting messed up. Um, Mary, I'm, I'm going to uh, move on to you and, and, and do a little intro um, um, for you. Well, ask you to do a little intro for you and what you do uh, before I go uh, back to Andrea. I, I guess people would like to know what is Dublin City Council uh, doing now in, uh, in support of uh, businesses, but also in terms of planning for a future in terms of night culture, what, what are we looking at? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Lord Mayor, and uh, hi to everyone, and thanks for your, sharing your lunchtime with us. Um, I, I started working for Dublin City Council back in, in 1986, having grown up in the inner city. Um, it's great to be able to, to work uh, for the City Council and, and the, the city that I love. Um, I started off in, in engineering, but then I took five years out to study fine art and then came back and got to work in the arts office in human resources and for the last six years I've been working in economic development and enterprise where we get to work closely with the business community particularly the early stage startup micro enterprises and you know we've seen directly how hard hit um, many of those businesses have been during the last year in particular and uh, the, the staff have been working very hard to support them on the economic uh, development side. We've been working closely with our councillors and our industry representatives on the Economic and Enterprise Strategic Policy Committee. And uh, as, as you've said, we've been working, looking at uh, culture, but particularly through the prism of uh, the evening and nighttime economy. And we've had um, a working group of our Strategic Policy Committee uh, looking at that issue, uh, along with uh, the work uh, that uh, you've you've led on uh, with the internet or with the National Task Force, and um, working alongside um, the Arts Office and you know other uh, offices that input into this. Because I think part of the challenge is that it's it's a it's a complex, multifaceted uh, area, and our our city uh, planners are also looking at it in, in the context of the next city development plan and you know, what way we want our, our city to be. Uh, the new plan will run for six years from 2022 and they're taking in a lot of input and feedback at the moment to shape that plan for the future. Unmute there. Um, and in terms of what you see, so in, so, 86, that's a long time. So you don't look that low, firstly. So, uh, and secondly, I guess, from seeing the city for that long a time, what do you think needs to be done better when it comes to nighttime economy? And when it comes to, because you've, you've been great on, on the task force in terms of, we, we myself and Mary have been looking at international best practices. And like, what do you see for the future after looking at the past and looking at COVID? What do you think can, can, can be done better? Well, I, I suppose we've great opportunities to learn from other cities and it, it was it was great to get to hear from other cities about how they're addressing, expanding their um, nighttime, evening economy, but the role of culture uh, within that. So what seems to have worked for a lot of those cities is just bringing together all of the players, you know, whether that's uh, from a, a licensing perspective or transportation or, or safety, uh, they, they seem to be issues that, that come up a lot that are barriers to people participating in the nighttime economy. Um, other, I think, great examples where expanding, you know, what the offering is, and Andrea has spoken there about community and building communities that different people want different things from um, a cultural offering in, in the city. They want it at different times and they 
wanted in different venues. But we wanted to do some research to see, you know, what the key barriers were, our aspirations. So we um, ran a survey, the Your Dublin, Your Voice survey, uh, where over a thousand Dubliners uh, responded. And, you know, it was very welcoming to see that they all agreed that evening and nighttime uh, culture and economy are important to Dublin. But there were differing views as to, you know, what people were looking for, uh, what they wanted to see more of or less of. And I think one of the challenges, as we've heard from other international cities, then is balancing the interests of, you know, those that want to be uh, enjoying the nighttime economy till uh, three or six in the morning and those that are are putting children to bed and uh, kind of a balance between a living city and a cultural city and a nighttime economy city. So uh, I think we don't have all the answers yet, but uh, I think we're on the road now to seeing what we need to do. And we're looking forward to the minister's report is coming out shortly on on the uh, national task force. Uh, It's been great to work closely with uh, Sunil Sharp and and give us the night and get those different perspectives and experiences. Uh, So I think that will all feed into the next stages and uh, Dublin is, is committed to um, now developing a strategy on the nighttime economy. This was one of the recommendations of our working group that just completed their, their work um, last month. Um, and I think that will give us more chance then to look specifically at uh, what can be done at uh, Dublin City Council as one of the, the stakeholders uh, working with others uh, to, to see improvements. Yeah. Andrea, since you like, I think from being very much part of the fabric, because I, I think what you own is part of the fabric of the city. And also what you've set up is also part of the fabric of the community of the city. If someone was to tell you, well, I, I ask you, what would you ideally want to see in the city in the next year or two when we come out of COVID in terms of night culture, in terms of uh, nighttime economy, what would you say? Like, what well, what would be the ideal, bearing in mind what uh, the barriers that Mary ha- has alluded to in terms of trying to f- find things that are one size fit all or maybe trying to separate them out? Well, will I answer personally or in a politically way? Well, personally, I, 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 I like it. Uh, personally is good. There, there's, there's no politically here. Like, this is the thing. I think we, the three of us come from very different backgrounds and we, but they're all quite similar in trying to find something that will work for the city. So I think whatever way you want to answer, you go for it. <laughs> well, personally, I'd like to see clubs that open for two, three, four days um, and that people are treated as adults that can, come and go as they please that it gets rid of binge drinking it gets rid of that rush at the end of the night to order loads of drinks to get in then to find uh, loads of taxis all that kind of jazz so all the safety around that and um, but also I I like going out for longer than four hours dancing so I'd love that personally um, but in a bigger picture I suppose it's a mixture of amenities so that like it's very hard to get a coffee late at night it's very hard to find somewhere to go to uh to and I, I'm conscious of also not turning into a working city that some people are working all the time but at the same time uh, we have shift workers we have di- people who work in different capacities we have people who have different requirements from the city so to see that there would be more amenities in terms of culture theater that goes on later galleries open later um, and we see the success on the likes of culture night when you can go and, and explore the city in this way um, but also also, I I kind of this is probably this is definitely not the right thing to say, but uh, go I, for it. This I think, <laughs> I, think no worries. I used to live on Georgia Street. I lived over the Dragon. If you commit to living in a city, you have to take on board what a city is. If you want peace and quiet the countryside or the suburbs or wherever can facilitate that. But I think if we have different places facilitating different energies, that that kind of answers the question of how do we make things fit for everyone? Because you can't have like a street with a club and uh, a school and chill. Do you know, like there there has to be different energy areas that facilitate those things. And like, even the other day I was down in uh, Poolbeck Heights and there's all this industrial, beautiful buildings that are way away from public that would be perfect for a gorge industrial club. So I think it is like, whilst we are being cognizant of, we have to make things work for everyone. If uh, somebody wants to, party till six but somebody wants to go go to bed at eight you kind of have to be cognizant of where you're choosing and I, I remember this to the sideline when I lived over the dragon someone bought an apartment underneath me and tried to get the dragon closed down because it was noisy and 
It was like, you moved in over a club. You've moved into Georgia Street, one of our main streets in the town. You know what you're buying into. And I think there's a, there, in, in internationally, there's an onus on uh, developers and on uh, people who are building around a city and around clubs that they have to be responsible for the soundproofing rather than the venues. So that does take, doesn't put the financial onus on the venues, but also allows the venues to thrive as what they are and that we can, we can, celebrate the venues for what they are and not have to put restraints on God. Sorry, you have to be quiet because, uh, yeah. Well, but David here has a, has a point that with the extent of the housing crisis, a lot of young people can't afford to rent in the city anymore and they can't afford to live in the city. So is it the case that we have more um, uh, clubs, we have more activities and facilities outside of Dublin as well because people can't, just can't afford to live in the city? I think we solved the, the housing crisis. Well, yes, <laughs> that, we're, we're trying to do that too. So I think that people will be faster in that. So, but yeah, like, uh, on, uh, like, but it's funny because Mary and myself would have seen it uh, on the task force is that some, because we were looking at it from a national level that it wasn't just about Dublin City, that there are areas that we have to start investing on to make sure that towns and villages and, uh, and, and cities have the same possibilities when it comes to night culture, that it doesn't, it can't just be the case that well, if you live in a village, you pop down to the pub, and that's it, kind of way. So, but uh, Mary, how how um, I, I guess to to um, David's question and Cormac as well, who has pointed to like right now, and you've been in the arts office yourself. We have culture night that is one night a year, like, uh, but then. A lot of times the success is, so Cormac was saying, culture night is a huge success, but it's a victim of its own success in that the venues are always broke now. And this is one of the things that's one night a year. Like what are the possibilities of making sure that it's expanded, that it's not just that, that our culture is the same as culture night, but for a lot more days in a year? Yeah, I think there's there's probably two big issues there. Like one is is the the venues and spaces, and you know, are there spaces that aren't currently being used that that could be used, and and what would the conditions of of, of that be? And then the second is the kind of programming, and you know, how how would you ensure that uh, you know the programming is such that you have a, a, a viability between you know what people are looking for and then the safe. Uh, transportation to, to get there and back and you know also um, a, a big issue that came up from other cities is, is taking care of the workers who are operating in the nighttime economy because um, there's a competing demand there again where you know our, our survey found a lot of people are looking for free or more affordable options but you know people working in the nighttime economy need to be paid a decent wage as well and um, so there, there's uh, probably a mix of issues there uh, I know that the question was about you know the lack of affordability for people being based in the city and you know that 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 is a challenge because ideally if you know we've, we've spoken about the 15 minute city if people could be closer to the the cultural spaces and the places that they, they love going and they're not facing long expensive journeys that that would be ideal um, but again from speaking to international colleagues a lot of them are looking at not maybe locating everything in their in their city center locations where there'll always be you know, a role uh, for, for further offerings in the city centre. Some of them are looking to, to um, you know, people uh, opting for more local uh, and maybe more um, suburban or uh, other uh, entities. So I would say we'll be kind of looking at all of that when we're developing uh, the, the policy for, for a nighttime economy uh, in Dublin and, and learning from international examples. Yeah, and on, on nighttime economy and learning from international examples, Cormac asking a question there made me realize because Cormac and myself talk about directly elected mayor online, and it's a subject that I've been talking to the other mayors about, and we're, we're looking at what will come in from Limerick in terms of, of I, I guess, looking at, uh, at their model and seeing what we can do then. Uh, but in terms of a nighttime mayor, that is something that's been mooted and it mooted, mooted a good few times with various of my colleagues, like Claire Byrne being one of them, me, Sonal, uh, Sonal like uh, Robbie Kitt and Andrea. I, I like to, I guess, hear your opinions on that because I look at Amy Name and she's done a huge amount of work over in London, but she's not without her her critics as well because during her tenure it's when what some of the biggest clubs in in uh, London closed down so do you think as a city we need one here and if so how would you think it will work and how do you think it will actually improve uh, at nighttime like culture in general how, how do you think it can can work with a, a daytime air and also the city in general so 
I think having someone whose prime focus is on the nighttime culture and economy uh, is obviously very valuable and somebody who understands it. And I think um, if you like a lot of the time, the issues are that it's people who I'm generalizing, so, but like people who aren't involved in it, in nighttime culture and don't understand the ins and outs. So you have these people who are so experienced who can bring this wealth of knowledge of how things work. And that was something that struck me of how uh, over the lockdown, we have this wealth of people who work in events and who work in, that are not being put to the use of their talents that they have to roll things out so it's like there is these amazing people who can make things happen really fast who know inside out what we need who understand security who understand safety who understand logistics um, and and most importantly stakeholder management because i the main thing that's involved in the in with having a nighttime mayor is managing and making sure everyone's talking to each other and everyone feels supported and that everyone feels like they're being represented and that there that it, it isn't just very uh, focused on making it commercially viable making it financially uh, work but that it is about bringing the culture of it that it is about uh, and the community of it and um, so yeah I think it is really important to have someone who has that prime focus for sure. I've just written down Andrea Horn for Nighttime Mayor here on my notes. So just, just, just so you know, I'm gonna take that as a pitch. So, but no, like this is the thing. You're like I, I've seen it through working for the picnic. I've seen it through working on gates that people who who work in the industry knows and know and if if we were to put a nighttime mayor or a star or whatever we want to call that person that it's someone within the industry and not just from a lobby group and would know exactly what we need to to, uh, to do and tie in better because at the end of the day it's it's about proper communications as well to know what's what's going on half the half the battle is understanding what the hell is going on and what can, can we do and what can't we do and hopefully that person if we do have that person can tie in with Dublin City Council and it would be it'd be a lot more transparent because what I've learned from this year is a lot of people don't know what happens in the City Council despite the amount of work Mary you and your team do and try to push it out a lot of times we we, we just don't a lot of people don't know what what the council does or or what happens behind the scene uh on on the subject of um like um, employee, uh, sorry, employees. Kevin was wondering a lot of nighttime work can be exploitative in nature with low wages and low union density. How do you suggest we deal with this so that those practices don't remain in an enhanced or improved nighttime economy? Mary, I'm gonna fire that one to you. Uh, thanks very much, Lord Mayor. Yeah, and I think that's a really difficult, difficult question, but it's one that really, is a very important question and, and you know, needs to be a part of any further evolving of, of a nighttime culture, nighttime economy. Um, it was interesting that uh, Sasha Lord from Manchester, who is, is working with uh, the, the mayor, mayor's office there was saying when he was first appointed to the, the role of, um, I, I think he's advisor rather than a star or, or manager, but he engaged in a listening, listening exercise where he went and spoke to the workers. And, you know, he, he took it very broadly, you know, as everybody in the nighttime workforce. So that included hospital workers and, you know, delivery drivers and, and broader than, you know, cultural workers. Um, and a lot of the issues, uh, you know, were, were raised with him. Now, it's, again, it's multifaceted. You know, some of the issues are probably being addressed by trade unions or, or other groups who are looking, uh, fighting for, for workers' rights. Um, but it, it certainly is a factor where um, other economies have seen that there can be worse working conditions operating in, in nighttime economy than in daytime economy. Uh, so it, it is a factor that would need to be taken into consideration um, around how, how the, the Dublin economy can further expand because we want uh, those working in, in that economy to you know, be paid well, but also that their safety of getting to and from their jobs and, and affordability transport, some of the issues that are similar for those who are um, you know, traveling in to enjoy the nighttime economy and, and the cultural offerings are the same for the, the workers. And um, so that's certainly something we will be factoring in when we're developing the policy. Sorry, thanks, Mary. Um, we, we talked about kind of uh, the, the making sure employees aren't exploited, but we also, there are some questions coming in about safety here. Andrea, in your time clubbing, in your time kind of uh, organizing club nights as well, 
like how do you how, how do you weight up the safety factor and in terms of how do we make the city safer for all but safer for women going clubbing because one of the things i've noticed uh, and maybe it's my own relatives whenever I told them I was going clubbing they always kind of raise their eyebrows and go well is it really safe for you to go out like and I'm there going why not like the city should is and should be a safe place but how do we encourage people in your mind of running club events what do you think is the key thing to make sure and how do we build that in for planning in the future to make sure that clubbing is a safe space in terms of uh, for women in terms of making sure that people uh, get to enjoy themselves on harass and harm and in terms of traveling back as well um we did a podcast with Merit Milan uh, who was the former Amsterdam nightmare uh, on United Ireland our podcast and he was talking about the feminist issue of what, uh, what uh, that comes into play with the nighttime economy but and I think that the minute you start having mixed use late time nighttime uses of a city instantly it's safer and we can see that with the with the uh, restrictions COVID restrictions at the moment town feels like a very different place when there's nobody around when things are closed you you don't have the the people around you don't have the safety around so the more people that are in there the safer it is um, and I think transport is a huge thing um, and also uh, clubs working together and all the and other facilities and amenities to have security in place to have uh, to have facilities in place that if there is an issue for women and if there is harassment or whatever that it can be dealt with and that there's um, an education program in place for how to run a safe club with each of those uh, stock stakeholders because if you just have a box and let people in and whatever you, and you're not um, educating your staff and and that can happen when you have young people who are just rolling in to do their job and rolling back out again in a bar whereas if like there has been so many safety campaigns of like how you can go to the barman and say a word of you're being harassed or whatever. So I think it is um, a multi-pronged approach, but I think having more people in the city for sure works immediately, good transport links and education programs. Thanks, Andrea. And Stuart uh, Clark asked me this for Hot Press of the Week. Drug testing in clubs, yes or no? So in terms of making sure people's drinks are safe and, and things aren't spiked, I, I, that was a question of, well, would you recommend it? Would you think it's something that we need? Um, people are going to take drugs. It's a fact. And uh, prohibition has never worked. It still isn't working. Uh, and so the question should be, would you prefer people to take dangerous drugs or would you prefer people to take safe drugs? Yeah, so I I was, when he posed it to me, I was more thinking at the bar of people's drinks being spiked. So I said, yes, definitely, mainly because it, it's a, it's a harm prevention more than anything else. But at the end of the day, like a club is a safe environment for you. So I, I'm, whatever people choose to do in it, it it's their choice as well. So um, like I, I've worked at the picnic when, when, when people, when someone had overdosed and it's not something I would like to see again, but it's not something, it's something that I will say to people if they are taking uh, um, uh, any substance, just do it safely. So in I, term, hmm? I think I've seen that with the campaigns from the HSC as well of, of how to take drugs safely. And I think we are definitely moving along in terms of, uh, putting our head in the sand that drugs are, are it's like if we just pretend they're not being taken because they're illegal and don't deal with it that isn't working and it hasn't worked and like play, so I think you we definitely have to look at mitigating that as opposed to ignoring it well it's it it, it it kind of tangentially goes into a different topic as well but one of my first visits were was to Sundial House and it was talking about harm prevention and harm reduction and how harm reduction works so and that's on the other extreme side of the scale when it comes to drug and drug usage but I think a lot of the times we need to trust people and we need to trust that they will well they, they'll take care of themselves so uh, also, if you look at the uh, damages from to people's health from different types of drugs, be it smoking, be it alcohol, um, and then the likes of uh, MDMA or cocaine, uh, there's much less harm done by party drugs. Yeah. 
I'm pretty sure at the end of this, there will be a headline of the Lord Mayor encourages people to take drugs, which did not happen at this session, I'd like to point out. It was more a discussion on, on uh, how people can be responsible themselves for substances. Um, now, Mary, how there's a question here from Neo. Uh, high rents have effect on supply side as well. It is hard to have diverse cultural offering, offerings when the only profitable model is high volume alcohol sales. How can we increase the types of nighttime and and therefore make it more attractive to a wider slice of the population. You deal with a lot of enterprise and businesses. So how is it that we balance it out that people that, that especially with the local economy and local enterprises, people can still make money, but at the same time, it doesn't directly impact as much on people's um, uh, opportunities to avail of amenities. What is the balance? Yeah, again, I think as as was raised, you know, further, we, we do have a lot of support for cultural venues across the city. I suppose the question of, um, you know, could there maybe be, uh, you know, better sharing of, of some of the spaces? Um, are there ways we can reimagine? Um, other cities have seen even the likes of, um, you know, hotel foyers or places that maybe aren't traditionally associated with uh, cultural activity, you know, changing uh, the, the use of, of uh, how they, they operate with, uh, you know, exhibitions, jazz clubs, uh, other approaches. So I think there is a, a chance now to kind of re, re look at, at the city and the spaces and um, we're, you know, seeing the impact that COVID has had on the city. And, and as we emerge uh, from it, you know, there, there could be changes of, of usage. Again, all of this is, is being looked at by the, the city planners as part of the, the next city development plan and, and trying to get that, that balance of um, where, where the, the venues are um, and, you know, affordability is all, always a factor and, and anybody, you know, running a space has to try and balance, um, even if there is a subsidy in the, in the mix, it's, it's still a, a kind of a whole uh, commercial uh, operation in the sense of having to, to, to balance uh, at the books. Um, so there's probably no simple answers as such, um, but, you know, even when you look at Temple Bar, you know, it, it was really designed as a, as a cultural part of the city and a huge amount of the cultural venues that uh, were established there are still operating, uh, albeit that, you know, there's, there's always uh, challenges in getting the balance right uh, between the, um, you know, other, other elements that tend to get more of the, the publicity. Um, but I think part of it is looking at, at what we have. Uh, our, our Dublin City Council Culture Company has done a, a venue mapping exercise and, and uh, all the cultural assets are there. So I think we, we still do need to kind of gather more data, have more of the, the understanding of, you know, what works, why it works, and are there factors then that set things up for success as, as opposed to being, you know, great uh, intention and, and great effort uh, go, going ultimately to waste because the commercial viability doesn't allow something to continue to be sustained. It's interesting that you say data there because yourselves have actually been gathering data, which is which is great to see because I think that's the only way to actually form a proper strategy instead of saying, well, we're just going to project on this instead. So, and in terms of the cultural map for people who don't know, uh, we launched it, I, I think a couple of weeks ago, Mary, if I'm not mistaken, it has everything from cultural venues, which aren't open yet, sadly, but they will be, but it also has outdoor space as well. And it kind of points in within your city, what's there for people in terms of outdoor space, in terms of uh, what you can bring, well, either your family or bring yourselves and meet people at. Um, Andrea, I'm, I'm asking, like there was a question here in terms of certain venues having moved out of the city because I saw this with uh, the show moving out to Jum Conjo and also Jam Park as well out there. Um, like, how do we keep the venues in the inner city? I know you, you, your thoughts are to get rid of hotels and get rid of student accommodation. Like, that comes into what Mary is saying into the next city development plan. That's why the next iteration of the plan is so important. But what do you think we can do to incentivize people to try to stay in the city more rather than move out to the outskirts? Or maybe you think moving out to the outskirts is, is better because we need to develop uh, towns and villages. Well, I think it's a two, a two prong thing. Firstly, I love hotels. Um, I just don't think we should have a monopoly of hotels. So hotels are one of my favorite things, let me just say first. Um, but I think it a, is a good thing that venues are moving outside because again, when we're talking about disturbing people and um, letting everyone live in peace, like Jam Park has the perfect setup. You can be as loud as you want. Um, when there's good transport links, it's, it's a great experience. Um, so I think there is definitely a lot to be said for, for moving outside of the city. But to keep people in the city, like I would love if there was um, 
built into development plans that a certain percentage of each new development had to have a cultural space that was uh, that didn't have an influx in uh, in price as it got more va valuable because what happens is uh, like people come in with all their big ideas and they uh, and they come in with set up their clubs and then it raises the value of the property and then suddenly the landlord is like here out you go cultural space see you later I'm going to make much more money here so if there was a, a way that we could build that into developments that there was a cultural space in each development that had to stay at a certain uh, percentage of of income or whatever that the, so that the uh, uh, rent didn't go up and that the cultural space wasn't just turfed out I think that would be a really good way of keeping places in the city um, and I think looking at places as being cultural and giving them the spe special treatment and that it that we aren't just looking at them to be commercially viable and leaving it up to uh, the people who are the entrepreneurs, because if we are looking at who is creating the city that we all own as equally as each other and um, if we're giving support to opera, if we're giving support to art, if we're giving support to all of these things, why are we not giving support to clubs and to dancing and to the nighttime economy? So there, I think we have to see it as culture and support it as culture to keep it going. And I don't think, like, I love hotels too. So, and I don't think hotels and community space are, are one or another. I think you can have both. Like, I, I lived in New York where uh, the lobby of hotels were, be, uh, were being used as community spaces, sometimes being used as galleries, sometimes being used as bingo halls. Uh, I lived in Hong Kong as well, where uh, a building, a hotel building, will have different purposes. The top floors were always the hotels, the rooms, the second, the uh, lower floors were. Um, um, floors were food courts, were uh, karaoke bars, uh, were uh, bowling alleys. Like there was a huge mix of recreation in it. And uh, there, the bottom was always the club then as well. And it, it's funny because maybe it's because we were building upward that that's what you can do with a building. And maybe that's something that in, in terms of the development plan, and this is why we were encouraging everyone to feed into the development plan, because I think at this juncture of, this, uh, of time in the city, it's really important and people actually express well this is what we want it to look like we're, we're kind of tired that previously it's all been sewn for this for for anything between student accommodations to hotels and and now they're empty all of those buildings are empty what do we do to move to to move to a different place leslie here is asking about the city center being gentrified and subsequent property prices are rising which is forcing out arts and recreational spaces and be by default creating uh, art and recreation recreation spaces in this city um, therefore increases the value of the property. Okay, so it's a bit of a vicious circle. Mary, how do we how do we make sure, like I know it will be coming in the next city development plan and hopefully in, in what we plan for the city, but in, in where you stand, how do we make sure we embed certain things now to create these spaces, to create these spaces where we don't have them and also to keep them where we do have them? Well, um, as you were saying there earlier, I think the, you know, the, the mapping exercise is important because at least we can establish that baseline. Um, I know the arts office have done some analysis, you know, of uh, creative spaces in the city and have seen that, yes, you know, a lot of spaces have gone, but others are, are being created. So I think it's important that, you know, we'd ensure that even if there's, there's flux happening and um, that, you know, the new spaces are, are being supported and created. And, and I think it is important that we have, you know, a good mix of them across, you know, the, the city centres as well as in, in the suburbs. And um, what maybe we, we don't have as much of is, you know, more um, spaces that can be used for, for different purposes, maybe smaller spaces that communities can take control of their own programming and, and events and, you know, other, other cities have that, you know, and Andrea's suggestion around, you know, that percentage, you know, would, would be great if we, we could see that um, built in because, you know, what we all agree with is, you know, how important culture is to us. We're lucky to have a city that is rich, you know, in, in culture, both in today's practitioners as well as historically, and not every city has that. So, you know, we really, uh, I suppose, need to look at every avenue that we can pursue uh, to ensure that Dublin remains a supportive city uh, for 
uh, for creative individuals who not only you know bring huge value in terms of their own work and careers but bring huge value you know to the city and you know Dublin as a city is competing like all cities for you know investment for for talent attraction and you know the the quality of life here and and you know culture is a huge aspect of that and um, is, is a big factor of why people might choose Dublin over over another city and um, I think the the real challenge is then how do we you know, take that kind of, you know, the economic benefit that comes from that and ensure that it, it supports then uh, the creators and, and the creative spaces and, and the cultural offering. And um, so I suppose they're, they're all elements that have been, you know, touched on through the, the work of the working group and the national task force. And, and we're uh, certainly keenly awaiting the, the national report to see, you know, how Dublin can take the recommendations from that and, and see then how we can implement them. But I think what we've learned from other cities is there's no probably silver bullet. It's a it's an iterative process. So you know you start with what you've got, you build on the strength, you 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 address the issues, and you try and uh, bring all the stakeholders in so that there's a, a holistic um, response to it. And I think that's probably how how we we will move forward on, on these matters. Can I say um, I'd love to see a co-op movement starting in cultural spaces as well. And it's a huge thing in the UK. And um, we were talking to someone about it recently and how empowering it can be to have a community in control of their space, but also then in charge of their programming and in obviously the, the board or whatever. But I think there's definitely um, space in Ireland to start upping our co-op because um, it, it, there's so many layers of value towards bringing people into the community and making them responsible and uh, part of it as well as uh, so not always depending on it to be done for them. Myself and Mary were looking at this one minute city model, Andrea, when we were looking at international best practices for nighttime economy. And in one minute city that uh, I think was Denmark or was it Sweden, Mary? I, I, I... I think Paris might have kicked off the... 50. the... 15 so, one but yeah. the the was the one minute one Denmark? Well, no, what it was Dem I think it was Denmark because the person that came to present was saying exactly what you just did, uh, uh, said Andrea, in terms of that co-op movement, that the buildings they had in terms of, of, um, of living residential was also part of a commercial and they were the ones controlling then the entities in terms of uh, what happened around those spaces. So be it that there was uh, cultural activities, be it that there was uh, group uh, dining events, it was all controlled by by the, uh, by the people who live there, which I think is exactly what we want in terms of uh, um, creating communities and in terms of creating something that isn't just about profit because it becomes something that people have ownership over and it's something that's more sustainable because you're not just trying to create a profit out of it. So, okay, we've come to the quarter to Mark, which normally we wrap up on. So I will ask one more question of the two of yourselves, which is what is your best uh, ever ex nighttime e cultural experience in the city and what is the one thing you want to start seeing happening once we come out of COVID? Uh, Mary first and then I'll go to Andrea. Um, I, I loved just following the Mockness parade, you know, through all the small streets off Capel Street and, you know, just that sense of pageantry and, um, you know, participation and, uh, you know, I think some sometimes just seeing the city being, you know, taken over like that and, and being able to, I suppose, enjoy relatively small events and feel so, so much part of the, the activity um, certainly is, is one that springs to mind. And what would you like to see when we come out of COVID? What's the first, what's the one thing, what big thing you want to see in terms of a nighttime culture? I, I think the way we're embracing our outdoor spaces, um, you know, I think if we could see see more of that and, and see more, you know, programming and, and activity out in, in the open, um, I think that would be a, a great uh, positive uh, co coming out of COVID. And I know, know there's work underway to, to try and support the infrastructure that would support that. Andrea? I'm, I'm waiting for fantastic things here. Thank you, Mary. That was <laughs> I have so many, I, like I just love the nighttime, but one that springs to mind, and I don't know if it was legal at the time, so, but it's, it's gone now, but it was uh, Spirit on Middle Abbey Street uh, was a club and it was, the, it was loads of fun, but it was open till six for some reason. And I don't know why, but there was, when there was, it was multifunctional so that 
there was like the main room that was for clubbing and dancing but then there was downstairs there was a boxing match being shown then in another room there was a film being shown and people were watching films then there was like foosball and activity tables um, and John Park have done a lot of this in terms of their activities that they've added in but it just felt like you weren't just on a one track night out that you didn't know what you could be doing at whatever time and it also gave you the freedom to leave whenever you want and I coming out of COVID I would love to be treated like an adult and to decide when I want to go home and not have to go to people's houses to continue on my night date. Um, I, I think that's brilliant for you and Mary. My my one, uh, like there's been lots of amazing nighttime moments, uh, but one particular one was when Def had um, had one of their gigs in St. Odin's and it was just this spectacular venue being in this uh, this uh, uh, old church and having electronic music going on and I remember distinctly that I was then in New York where there was another uh, gig in the church and I just went this happened in Ireland already so and it was like very much going whatever you're like you're, you're, you're just like we're already there and I would like us to get back to that stage where there are little mini festivals happening around our city where there's mini cultural events happening around our city so it's like almost like a culture night but every night I would also like like the, the possibility that, and this is a huge, ar not argument, but something that we're all pushing the council on in that there will be outdoor space because I just reminisce on the times that I'm at three in the morning stumbling out of uh, uh, work in Hong Kong and being able to grab something to eat and it's delicious and it's street food and there's a community there as well. So I want, I would like us to to get to that stage in our city where you 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 feel safe, you feel like you uh, uh, can get anything you want in terms of food, beverage, and you meet people that you know as well. So, so thank you so much, everyone. And um, I know some questions we didn't answer. Uh, if you email us in, we will try to answer it. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea and Mary, uh, for taking your time. And thank you all for listening and enjoying your lunch break with us. So we'll be back next week. But um, thank you. Uh, Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. Thank you.